title, The Final Analysis. <coughs> Principle, Scripture teaches one of three destinies for Adamic man. The heavens and beyond, where he will be given dominion over the creation, or an eternal earth habitation, where he'll be a custodian under a sovereign, or eternal separation from life <clears throat> and all that pertains to it. This is basically in the mode of a review. Scripture teaches those who qualify for the heavenly position will be those who have produced works which will endure into eternity. Turn to Matthew 25. Verse 19 to 21. After a long time, the Lord of those servants cometh and reckoneth with them. And so he that had received the talents came and brought other five talents, saying, Lord, thou deliverest unto me five talents. Behold, I have gained beside them five talents more. His Lord said unto him, Well done, thou good and faithful servant. Thou hast been faithful over a few things. O make me ruler over many things. Enter thou into the joy of thy Lord. So we find <coughs> rulership predicated off of works that endure into eternity, giving more than we have received. <clears throat> Luke, the 19th chapter, verses 15 to 17. that when he was returned having received the kingdom and he commanded those servants to be called unto him to whom he had given the money that he might know how much every man had gained by trading then came the first saying Lord thy pound hath gained ten pounds he said unto him well thou good servant because thou hast been faithful in a very little have thou authority over ten cities so again it's the abundance over what has been given that will determine <coughs> possession that's to be had in eternity. The question arises, what do these things represent? <coughs> in, <coughs> in Matthew, what we find the talent represent the person's gift and calling, their place in the scheme of things. God puts everyone into a position in the body of Christ. He expects each one to develop that position above and beyond what it was when he was first placed into it. In the case of the pounds <coughs> in Luke, it represents faith. Everybody receives the same amount, one pound. They develop that. The scripture refers to everybody starting off with the measure of faith <coughs> across the board. And everybody develops, grows in faith. And it is the faith that enables the individual to develop the works. Now, turn to 1 Corinthians, 3rd chapter, verse 12 to 14.
Now, if any man build upon this foundation, in other words, the foundation is what he's given. What he builds upon it is what he adds. Gold, silver, precious stones, wood, hay, stubble. Every man's work shall be made manifest. The day shall declare it, because it shall be revealed by fire. The fire shall try every man's work of what sort it is. If any man's work abide, which he has built thereon, he shall receive a reward. <coughs> the work that endures. He was given five talents. He gained five more. <coughs> given one pound, he gained ten. So, the Father is looking at the <coughs> addition, what was given. <coughs> Turn to Revelation 14, verse 13. And I heard a voice from heaven saying unto me, Right, blessed are the, the dead which do die in the Lord from henceforth. Yea, saith the Spirit, that they may rest from their labors and their works. Do follow them. Works follow them into eternity. The <coughs> abundance of what they have gained is eternal. never passes away. And this is what the Father is looking to see as we enter into His presence, into eternity. What did we do with what He gave us? When we pass this life, we cease from work. Scripture says, <coughs> uh, basically, they may rest from their labor. So, we enter into, enter into the Sabbath of eternal rest <coughs> from works. The works that we have performed in this life are what's going to carry us into eternity. Determine where, what our position is, what we have, and how we comport ourselves in eternity. We no longer do any labors. Principle, those who qualify for the highest position will be those who have invested in preparing others for eternity. Those who qualify for the highest position will be those who have invested in preparing others for eternity. Turn to Matthew, the 24th chapter, verse 45 to 47. <coughs> then is a faithful and wise servant whom his Lord hath made ruler over his household to give them meat in due season. It's talking about the individual who's called to that position feeding the flock that position of investing in others eternity. Blessed is that servant whom his Lord shall find when he cometh shall find so doing. Verily I say unto you, that he shall make him ruler over all his goods. <clears throat> so we find in the other two parables, they receive a reward commensurate with the excess, what they have gained from their labors. But it's not all. It's a percentage based on what they have gained. This is talking about the individual who's called to inherit all. And he's put into position with the scripture saying, Whom his Lord hath made ruler over his household to give them meat in due season. The highest calling is the one who is called 
to feed the flock. Turn to Daniel, 12th chapter. Daniel, the 12th chapter, verse 3. They that be wise shall shine as the brightness of the firmament. They that turn many to righteousness as the stars forever and ever. So it's talking about the highest positions are given to those. The word wise there basically is teacher. <coughs> the other is basically soul winner. Those will have the highest positions in commensurate glory. The highest glory kingdom. <clears throat> Principle. Those who have no eternal works to show for their time here, but are saved only, will inhabit positions of servitude under kingdom authorities on the earth eternal earth. Luke 19, verse 16. Then came the first saying, Lord, thy pound hath gained ten pounds. Now, drop down to verse 24 to 26. Same chapter. And he said unto them that stood by, Take from him the pound, <coughs> and give it to him that hath ten pounds. And they said unto him, Lord, he hath ten pounds. So it's talking about the first person that came who had gotten the greatest amount receives the pound from the guy that had added nothing. Now what does the pound represent? The pound represents the person's faith. What is the faith? The faith is what saves you. The faith is what you live by. <clears throat> both in this life and in eternity. So what's being said is that the person who had the one pound is now connected to the person that had the ten pounds. And the person that had the ten pounds is given rulership over ten cities. So that means the person who had the one pound is now <coughs> lost it, becomes a servant to the person that had the ten pounds dwelling in one of the cities that the person will be ruling over on the earth. Notice what he goes on to say. In verse 26, So I say unto you, <clears throat> that unto every one which hath shall be given. And from him that hath not, even that which he hath shall be taken away. He's talking about the excess. The person that has been given in his excess is going to receive more. The person it's given and has no excess is going to lose what he was originally given. Then he goes on, <clears throat> but These mine enemies which would not that I should reign over them, bring hither and slay them before me. So this is talking about his return to earth. So this is referring to rulership on the earth. The individual that had nothing to show for his time is going to remain a custodian in a custodial position on the earth under the supervision of the individual who is ruled over ten cities. <clears throat> Revelation 21 verses 23 to 24.
and the city had no need of the sun, neither of the moon, so we know the city is resting on the earth, had no need of the sun, neither of the moon, to shine in it, for the glory of God did lighten it, and the Lamb is the light thereof. And the nations of them which are saved, the ethnic groups of them which are saved, shall walk in the light of it, the city. And the kings of the earth do bring their glory and honor into it. Glory and honor <coughs> as sovereigns enter into the city. The saved stay outside of the city and they walk in the light of it. So they're going to be resident earth dwellers. They're going to be living <coughs> in the sovereign regions of the kings of the earth under their authority. Having limited access into the city, we you notice know, what it says, the kings bring their glory into the city, but the saved remain only in the light of the city on the outside. They come in... <coughs> to receive the leaves of the tree of life for healing but that's all they come in to worship the Lord at specific time that's all then they leave the city is for the greats the city is for those who are rulers <coughs> sovereigns of the kingdom this is on earth the saved have no recourse into heaven at all. Uh, they forfeit that when they have no works um, to show for their time. Heaven primarily is predicated for those who have rewards and positions. Eternity is going to be the greatest caste system ever because it will never be breached, never be crossed. Once a person enters into eternity, that's his position for eternity. And these who have nothing to show for their time will at least be earth dwellers in a paradise region. And they'll be happy, they'll be joyful, but they'll be limited. Now, turn to Matthew, the 25th chapter, verse 27 to 30. <coughs> Now it is therefore to have put my money to the exchangers, and then at my coming I should have received mine own with usury. Take therefore the talent from him, and give it unto him which hath ten talents. For unto every man, and to every one that hath shall be given, and he shall have abundance. But from him that hath not shall be taken away even that which he hath. And cast ye the unprofitable servant into outer darkness. There should be weeping, gnashing of teeth. We find the difference between this guy and the one who had the one <coughs> pound is the pound represents faith, which he had. This individual rejected everything that he had. He took his talent and he buried it, meaning that he totally cut himself off from it. He did not regard it, had no use for it. And therefore, <coughs> what we find, he's, he's uh, determined, he's described as being unprofitable. He did absolutely, was of absolutely no benefit to God whatsoever. So therefore, his destiny is exile from life, from the creation, from all that pertains to God. So we find a panoply of <coughs> levels of existence. Each one determines where he's going to be day by day. That's why it's so important to develop an eternal perspective on daily activity because an eternal perspective on a daily basis 
gives us an ability to have a fixed position on our progress. We can gauge whether we're veering off, whether on line, or whether we're not progressing, or whether we are progressing by the vision that the Father will give us as we open up to it. But if we just continue to focus on the here and the now, we're not going to be able to gauge our progress or gauge the motion or whether we're even in motion. Bottom line is 90% of the body of Christ today doesn't have the faintest idea of the Father's plan, the faintest idea of their purpose, the faintest idea of the direction because the leadership doesn't give it to them. And if they don't study the scripture for themselves, they will never find it. Those who that do will have a unique opportunity, a unique position to <clears throat> totally go for all that the Father has made available to them. And they will be the movers and shakers in eternity. Title, things to come. First of all, scripture teaches the current order is being destroyed by Lucifer and the Luciferians. We are, I believe, already under attack by the fourth empire. Turn to Isaiah, the 10th chapter, verses 5 to 6. Assyrian, the rod, <coughs> the rod of mine anger, the staff that is in their hand, <coughs> is mine indignation. <coughs> so we find two things, the Assyrian and the they, so it's referring to Lucifer and Luciferians. I will send him against the hypocritical nation and against the people of my wrath. I give him a charge <clears throat> to take the spoil, take the prey, and to tread them down like the mire of the streets. To tread them down like the mire of the streets. Turn to Daniel, 7th chapter, verse 23. <clears throat> Thus he said, The fourth beast shall be the fourth kingdom upon earth, which shall be diverse from all kingdoms. So first of all, it's talking about an altered kingdom, unlike any human kingdom. And shall devour the whole earth, and shall tread it down and break it in pieces. So it attacks in two stages. It devours and then breaks it down, shatters it, and smashes it. <clears throat> now the injunction in the scriptures tells us to be soberly vigilant for your adversary the devil goeth about seeking whom he may devour. How do the Luciferians devour? By <clears throat> manifesting the influence of evil which manipulates, dominates, and ultimately controls the actions of men. When that happens, then they're destroyed. So what we see now, turn to Second Thessalonians, the second chapter. See now, 
is the mystery of iniquity. Verse 7. For the mystery of iniquity doth already work. Only he who now letteth will let until he be taken out of the way. The mystery of iniquity deals with the subtle influence of the darkness element being introduced into human society, affecting and afflicting the mind and emotions of the human race, literally turning men mad, changing the objective ability to think clearly of the subjective of uh, uh, imagine, imagination which is widely open to being influenced. It's how the flood came upon the human race. This is what's happening now. Satan devours by manipulating the actions and the activities of men <coughs> through the mind and through the emotions, causing them to deviant, become deviant in their lifestyles and their behavior <coughs> until they're ultimately destroyed. <clears throat> Turn back to Isaiah, 10th chapter, and we're going to pick up verses 7 and 12. Good, thanks. Isaiah, the 10th chapter, verses 7 to 12. <clears throat> How be it, he meaneth not so, neither doth his heart think so. But it is in his heart to destroy and cut off nations, not a few. What we have here, Lucifer has given a man mandate go forth and judge. But he is <clears throat> basically going to exceed his mandate in his heart. The anger and the desire to reap and wreak destruction on the human race is unbridled. For he saith, Are not my princes altogether kings? Is not Calno as Kamish? Is not Hamath as Arpad? Is not Samaria as Damascus? <clears throat> so what he's talking about here is uh, the principality that dominate the human race. He's going to use them to bring about his own agenda. As my hand have found the kingdoms of the idols, in other words, founded the kingdoms of the... He's the one that brought in idolatry brought in polytheism. So he's saying, As my hand has found, founded the kingdoms of the idols, and whose graven images did excel them of Jerusalem and Samaria. So here he's talking about <coughs> men worshipped his idols greater than they did YHVH. Shall I not, as I have done, and to Samaria and her idols do also to Jerusalem and her idols. <clears throat> Wherefore it shall come to pass, when the Lord hath performed his whole work upon Mount Zion and on Jerusalem, I will punish the fruit of the stout heart of the king of Assyria and the glory of his high looks. Now people reading this, and I would say 90% of the people reading this think is talking about Assyria, the Assyrian nation and the king. But the Assyrian nation never conquered Jerusalem. <clears throat> the Lord brought on judgment on them when they surrounded Jerusalem in the days of Isaiah, drove them back and wiped out the king. <clears throat> this is talking about Lucifer. It's talking about him having a hand, a free hand, 
<coughs> to bring down the Demic order and afterward he is going to be brought down and his pride and his haughty uh, 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 attitude is going to be humbled. Here we have <coughs> like a thread running through the scriptures is the Lord's plan. When he has performed his whole work, in other words, traversing to the end of the tribulation period at which point Israel will go again into captivity and be delivered, then he's going to deal with <coughs> Lucifer. Turn to Jeremiah 25th chapter verse 26. judgment cup and all the kings of the north far and near one with another and all the kingdoms of the whole world which are upon the face of the earth and the king of Sishak shall drink after them the king of Sishak is Lucifer so the Adamic water will be destroyed by Lucifer then at the end his kingdoms are going to be destroyed <coughs> principle. Scripture teaches that Lucifer will leave the Adamic metropolises in ruin <coughs> through cataclysms. In other words, he's going to use natural <coughs> the natural order to bring about uh, partially the destruction of the human race the destruction of the human race's civilization along with the <clears throat> spiritual influence the devouring influence of the human race turn to Isaiah 14 verses 16 to 17 They that see thee shall narrowly look upon thee and consider thee, saying, Is this the man <coughs> that made the earth to tremble, that did shake kingdoms, earthquakes, volatile displays of unstable elements being unleashed upon the earth, that made the world as a wilderness, and destroyed the cities thereof that opened not the house of his prisoners. Lucifer, I believe, is already <coughs> involved using his powers to create earthquakes, <coughs> tremendous upheavals to undermine, shake, and cause destruction upon the Adamic water. The great firestorms that are sweeping the uh, vast areas of uh, <coughs> The United States, Australia, places in Europe, brought about as a result of the weather pattern changes. Tremendous heat, tremendous drought, causing the air, the atmosphere to become dry and brittle and wide open to the slightest spark to cause an incendiary firestorm. And then the winds sweep up and carry it even into greater distances. <coughs> Volcanic activities taking place all over the earth. Five major ones taking place in Indonesia, all of them around Mount Krakatoa. Earthquakes happening on a daily basis, undermining the uh, land masses that support the continents. Lucifer is unleashing the elements to bring about destruction to the human race. At the same time, his minions, the tares, have gained control of human societies in the form of the banking, <coughs> corporate cartels, <coughs> governments <coughs> under the leadership of madmen, 
which are there to cause disruptions in the human society so that <coughs> the needs of the multitudes in the structure that God ordained for them to inhabit will not be available. You have humans uprising against their leadership all over the place because of injustices that are taking place. This all goes into destroying the fabric of the human order. Turn to Jeremiah, fourth chapter, verse 23 to 26. <coughs> I beheld the earth, and lo, it was without form, and void in the heavens, and they had no light. I beheld the mountains, and lo, they trembled, and all the hills moved lightly. I beheld, and lo, there was no man, and all the birds of the heavens were fled. I beheld, and lo, the fruitful place was a wilderness, when to keep that word in mind, wilderness. And all the cities thereof were broken down at the presence of the Lord, and by his fierce anger. Turn back to Isaiah 14. Verse 17. They had made the world as a wilderness and destroyed the cities thereof that opened not the house of his prisoners. So what we find <clears throat> is this destructive influence is going to intensify in all areas. Spiritual, physical, mental, emotional. It will be as though a pressure is being applied in all areas. People are going to feel more and more desperate, more and more limited, more and more controlled, more and more imprisoned, they'll feel these influences and they'll strike out against them and ultimately they'll be manipulated to strike out against each other. Scripture teaches, out of the desolate habitations of the Adamic order, <coughs> YHVH will gather the Israelites back to the land. Keep in mind the word <coughs> wilderness in Jeremiah and Isaiah. Turn to Deuteronomy, 32nd chapter, verses 10 to 12. He found him in a desert land, and in the waste, howling wilderness. He led him about, he instructed him, he kept him as the apple of his eye. As an eagle stirreth up her nest, fluttereth over her young, spreadeth abroad her wings, taketh them, beareth them on her wings, so the Lord alone did lead him, there was no strange God with him. They're going to be gathered out of the ruins of the Adamic civilization back to the land <coughs> by YHVH. There the richness of the whole region will come to fruition under YHVH. Restoration of the Judean law 
the society, theosophical society, <coughs> under the rulership of a descendant of David, restoration of the Levitical priest class, animal sacrifices, everything is going to be reinstituted. There's also going to be another gathering. That's interesting. Why is that all been reinstituted? That negates what Christ did. Yes. <laughs> well, it's re being reinstituted because uh, Israel rejected Christ. And there were promises that were given to David that had not been fulfilled. And beside that, YHVH <coughs> will have his time in the sun also. <coughs> Scripture teaches Elohim will gather the churches into regions prepared for them under the guidance of the new covenant angels. Jeremiah 23 verses 1 to 4 Woe be unto the pastors that destroy and scatter the sheep of my pasture, saith the Lord. Therefore thus saith the Lord God of Israel, Against the pastors that feed my people, you have scattered my flock and driven them away, you have not visited them, behold, I will visit upon you the evil of your doings, saith the Lord. And I will gather the remnant of my flock out of all countries whither I have driven them, will bring them again to their foals. They shall be fruitful and increase. Now, 99.99 tenths of the people reading this will say it's referring to Israel. Now, Israel, to a certain degree, it's true. They're going to be gathered at the second coming back permanently. This is referring to a gathering that takes place before that referring to the church. The leadership of the church is under judgment. The leadership of the church is going to undergo the wrath of God. A new leadership is going to be raised up. And I will set up shepherds over them which shall feed them and they shall fear no more, nor be dismayed. Neither shall they be lacking, saith the Lord. Now, people looking at this, again, would say it's Israel because Israel is pictured as being scattered. Unbeknownst to most people, the Bible also pictures the church as being scattered. The church underwent a judgment 300 years after the ascension back to heaven of the Lord. The scriptures were taken away from them. They came under tremendous persecution by the world church we went through the inquisition period with thousands tens of thousands hundreds of thousands were killed they went through tremendous times where they didn't have a scripture that they could read it was only until the printing press until the bible was codified again that the scriptures brought into the hands of the common man the church has been scattered also, just like Israel. Turn to Ephesians, the first chapter, verses 9 to 10. Having made known unto us the mystery of his will, according to his good pleasure which he had purposed in himself, that in the dispensation of the fullness of times he might gather together in one all things in Christ, both which are in heaven and which are on earth, even in him. The church has not been gathered together in one. You've got denominations, you've got separation. 
there is no unity at this point because the terror influence still is there to separate. There's going to be a gathering of the church.